After the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in the late 5th and early 6th centuries, a number of political units cropped up in the resulting power vacuum. Some of these, like the Merovingian Kingdom, we have ample evidence for as the standards of the early Middle Ages are concerned. For some others, particularly those in the British Isles or beyond the old Rhine-Danube frontier during those periods, we have significantly less evidence. Oftentimes, medievalists need to work with sparse textual sources and an ever-increasing amount of archaeology, and those two types of sources don't always match up. What this usually leads to is a discussion of those post-Roman states with the terms probably, possibly, and maybe sprinkled throughout the discussion. This video is going to take a short look at one of those kingdoms, the Kingdom of Thuringia, and due to the scarcity of evidence that we actually have, it is, as the video title suggests, somewhat mysterious. What is known for certain is that the Thuringian Kingdom was destroyed between 531 and 534, during a war conducted by the Franks under the sons of Clovis. Everything else, even the actual geographic extent of the kingdom, is far less clear because the textual and the material evidence is difficult to interpret. There have been proposed connections between the Thuringians and earlier peoples mentioned in Greco-Roman texts, but what we can definitely say is that a group of people called the Thuringians first show up in two sources, Vigetius's military treatise, and one of the poems of Sidonius Apollinaris, both dated to the mid to late 5th century. So in terms of a time span that we can absolutely back up with evidence, the Thuringian kingdom probably existed between 430 and about 530. So roughly 100 years at the longest extent, but it may possibly be less than that. Sidonius Apollinaris tells us that they formed part of the army that fought with Attila at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains in 451, and it's due to that apparent connection that it has been suggested that, if the Thuringians were within the Hunnic sphere of influence, then they might have been the same people as the Torcolingi, but that is far from clear. In any case, the textual sources that we do have for the Thuringians, the letters of the Ostrogothic king Theodoric, the histories of Gregory of Tours, the histories of Procopius, a short text on the origin of the Lombards, and the later Carolingian law code, give a picture of the Thuringian Kingdom being based generally around the Harz Mountains and the Thuringian Forest. That much is generally agreed upon, but the archaeological material we have for these people significantly complicates the picture because it potentially brings the Huns into play, and it potentially alters the size of this kingdom. The last 40 years or so of the 5th century were a time of social crisis and political upheaval across the northern zones of the Western Roman Empire and across the river systems into the frontier as Roman control began to recede from these areas. Across that entire region we begin to find well-furnished, relatively wealthy graves, and part of those grave goods comprise weapons, including swords. Now at one point it was thought that these graves were clear evidence of militaristic invaders, but a better explanation is that they are probably attempts at elite differentiation undertaken by families during periods of societal stress in order to draw distinctions between them and everybody else. And in these particular cases, they took place in a context which included some population movement and a restructuring of ethnic identities. The last quarter of the 5th century saw a specific form of this burial practice arise in the core area of the Thuringian Kingdom, known as the Nienberger Group. Those graves have a number of skeletons with artificially elongated skulls. In other words, this culture practiced cranial deformation among some of its members, probably to demarcate a difference in societal rank or power. Cranial deformation was a practice often attributed to the Huns, among other nomads hailing from the Eurasian steppe, and because the Thuringians served with the Huns in the 450s, it is quite possible that during the breakup of Attila's empire after his death in 453, Either some Huns played a role in establishing this kingdom, or some members of the Thuringian elite took this Hunnic practice with them into Central Europe. Either way, those cemeteries do exhibit influences stemming from regions previously under the control of the Huns. The two other main forms of archaeology we have for evidence here are a particular style of brooch and a particular style of pottery. This pottery is found in two large concentrations. In the core area of Thuringia, and slightly farther to the southeast in a group of cemeteries in what is today roughly the Western Czech Republic. But it also extends up the Elbe River to the coast of the Baltic and the North Seas, and it's also concentrated along the Upper Danube and the Middle Rhine. This actually predates the appearance of anything related to the Thuringians by a few decades because the earliest finds are from the late 4th century, but what matters is that it signifies these rivers as being a major trade route in this period, 
along which Thuringian influence probably expanded. The brooches have been a bit more problematic. Two older views have been to see this either as representing an area where Thuringian power was definitely exercised due to the sheer number of fines, while the alternative argued for the brooches signifying evidence of Thuringian habitation outright. However, because there are large gaps of territory between the core of the kingdom and some of these finds, a more recent, admittedly more balanced view of the material is that they represent a choice on the part of local populations. The concentrations of Thuringian metalwork along the Rhine represent the frontier zone between that kingdom and the Merovingian kingdom. Rather than being under the direct control of the Thuringians, this probably should be interpreted as the local population viewing them as an alternative to Merovingian dominance, and choosing to adopt aspects of their material culture in doing so. There is a similar phenomenon going on around the modern state of Lower Saxony at the same time. Neither of these situations, on the Rhine or in Lower Saxony, have to directly signify actual control. Instead, it appears that the two areas were regions of competition between the Merovingians and the Thuringians, whose kingdom would then appear to have been something of a power in Central Europe, and the locals made their decisions accordingly. There are hints in the textual sources that by the early 6th century, the Merovingians were gaining more and more influence and actual control over these areas, and that this was probably done at the expense of the Thuringians. By 530 or so, with the overall defeat of the Thuringians by the Franks, the Elbe River once more turned into a corridor along which various people moved, probably attempting to escape the chaos created by the breakdown of Thuringian hegemony. It's during that period that the Thuringian king, Bisson, married into a people who appear to have been related to them in some way. These are the Lombards, and his own daughter married the first securely attested Lombard king. This group is recorded as having moved from the Upper Elbe at some point in time, but the date's not clear. But by the late 5th century, the Lombards were living along the Upper Danube and appear to have been part of the Thuringian kingdom. By 526, they are recorded as having moved into Pannonia, and due to the marriages, it's possible that some Thuringians went with them. There, they came into conflict first with the Heralds, then the Gepids, and finally the Avars. This proved too much, and in 568 they were led by the King Alboin across the Alps and into Italy. Much like during the breakup of the Roman Empire, during the violence and conflict surrounding the downfall of the Thuringian Kingdom, people were once again on the move, and those resulting movements would bring a new wave of kingdoms, fully ushering Western Europe into the early Middle Ages.